Uh, hey, we are now. Ah, oh, wow. So the guide of Bob Marley, the white self-existing wizard, um, well, is here. My dad and myself, a white self-existing dog guide of. And dad, how you going? I'm well, thanks. Peace one, and you? <laughs> I'm really good, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, spe- it feels special uh, that you're joining us here um, from Canberra. How yeah, is I'm pr- privileged to be on air. <laughs> you are. Yeah, blowing through the air we are. Um, and uh, how's it going in Canberra? <laughs> well, I'm um, pretty good, actually. Um, I, incidentally, I heard you talking earlier about coal seam gas, and looks like... Uh, uh, Mr. Windsor, man, has got a compromise out of the federal government with this mining tax to put some money into research. I don't know if you heard that. Mate, there's so much going on. I'm glad you're he- here to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what's Tony Windsor done? Oh, well, he's... To let the mining tax go through, um, he's forced the, the, uh, the government into putting some money into independent, independent research into coal seam gas exploration as far as I understand right mm. are you aware of a convoy that's leaving from Nimbin tomorrow uh, up going up to Gladstone to well uh, because I was listening to your station yes I am <laughs> uh, yeah but it's not in the main media yet because that's that's what's going to happen yep um, it's going to hit the big the big time because we're all um, putting our attention on uh, stopping it right there yep. and um, going in another direction and that's great to hear. Tony Windsor backing us up there on the political level. Yep. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure we, we're going to touch some political things in our discussion tonight, but it's not all that. Um, thank you very much for... Hey, I can say it on air. Thanks for, for giving life to me, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, accidents happen. <laughs> Look, it makes me wonder if I was an accident. Like, you married... <laughs> you, got mar- you got married uh, seven years almost to the day before I was born. Yeah. Oh, there was a bit of love there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for for um, building that beautiful garden that I got to play in so much as a, a little fella. Oh, that's right. I'm still playing in my garden, a different one. <laughs> yes, uh, you're there looking after your parents, aren't you? That's correct. Your grandparents. Mm. And we're, we're, we're privileged to have still alive yeah, in their tr- 80s. It's amazing. Yes, it's true. You've got a good gene, so you should carry on for a while. I hope so. <laughs> well, thanks thanks for that. It's all, I suppose, uh, well, just, just be grateful for what, for what we have. Absolutely. Yes. And we've got songs songs of yours also, you're chosen tonight. Oh, yes. yeah. Well, quick, roughly, <coughs> yeah, just ones that sprung to mind very quickly. And mm. ones that probably aren't always heard. Oh, some of them are pretty mainstream and some of them are a bit old hat and... But there's a few that I don't hear on normal radio, so I thought I'd put those in. And it's fantastic that we've got uh, the, the internet, internet as a resource so I could find these songs to share. Yeah, yeah, isn't that great? Mm. Um, now, I just wonder, have you seen the artwork for tonight's show, Dad? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you, can, you can check it out. I know you're not on Facebook anymore, um, but uh, you can see it at my blog site, dpol.wordpress.com. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the reason I mentioned it is I chose a particular art piece that uh, I jazzed up into the moment. Um, felt, you know, like the dimensions of things, you know. Mm-hmm. Something's created at this point, but you don't know what it's exactly for, and then you're using it at another point, and so on. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I used this particular piece of art. Uh, like you're going to have to check it out. And uh, Instead of another one, which is a montage of, of my life, and it uh, honour you and mum, and uh, so that's inside the blog. But uh, I use this other one, which has uh, pictures of, of uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge, be just before it was built and when it's completed, uh-huh. and discovered uh, just looking at in the Wikipedia that the it was your birthday. It was actually your birthday, 16 years before you were born. That yeah. uh, Sydney Mighty. Harbour Bridge. Yeah, it was, I think it was, that was the day it was open, 19th of March, 1936, is that right? 32. 32. And we've got this four-year time-lapse thing, Dad. Um, now, just introducing my dad came as um, a 10-pound poem to Aussie land back in uh, at the end of the 60s and set up a, a cleaning business uh, 
pretty much uh, out of nothing and ended up uh, having a big uh, uh, government offices there in Canberra you had contracts for, including the, the High Court of Australia. And um, we, we were just talking about this the other day, discovered that uh, Dad actually took on the contract from when it was actually built and just about four years out on uh, your memory. Dad, you're about four years off. Mm, yeah. um, you were thinking it was 1984, but it was 1980 that the High Court of Australia in yeah, Canberra yeah, was opened. Right. Yeah, Queen well, opened it. Yeah, good on her. And, uh, well, and she was here. She was here in the last month. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they brought they brought the the, Ad, the admiral's barge from Sydney Harbour down, and put it on Lake Burley Griffin with a team of sailors to transport her from Government House to to Commonwealth Park for the so she could look at the flowers dying in <laughs> in Floriade, which is our great national event, of course, every year, Floriade. Everyone should come and look at Floriade. But it had just finished, and so the, the flowers weren't looking their best. Mm. But anyway, it's still wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to cover some more of, more about that. Uh, you know, that four-year time-lapse thing. I, I wonder if me being on the scene and my, my brother... Um, might have caused, you know, I was there in the garden for a while, but then you and mum had to do, you know, work and stuff. So we had to leave the garden a bit, and and um, yeah. it must have been pretty hectic, Dad, so I apologise for any of the inconvenience I might have brought to your life. Um, yeah, I should hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, let's make it better tonight. Um, I reckon this, this song that you have requested is probably a good idea. Uh, one of them, and just get that happening up here. Mm. And um, yeah, what else is what else is happening locally for you today? Today, um, I ride my bike down to into town. Um, had a quick beer at the Wigan Pan Pub, which is the best place in Canberra to have a beer if you like. Um, if you like authentically brewed beer rather than the pasteurized stuff you buy elsewhere. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, and riding the bike's great. Canberra's great for riding bikes. Um, well, I've got a song that's actually got the word bicycle in it um, about yeah. to happen, but I was, I was going to say that uh, I, I am aware that at one point in time in the, the scheme of things that you you actually had an opportunity to buy the Hahn Brewery before it became a... <laughs> Well, it was it was for sale when um, in the late eighties when, the, when there was this huge um, rise in interest rates. No one was making any money, but I'd managed to sell something. I had spare cash, and that was an option that I I knew it was for sale. And, but I, I never pursued it. Probably just as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would have right. drunk the profits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'd have been a lot of beer yeah. <laughs> these days. Yes. Um, but Dr. Chuck Hahn, who started that one, um, what's now called the Malt Shovel Brewery, um, yeah, and um, yeah, no, I didn't. I've been, I've always been interested in beer and brewing. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, right. I just want to acknowledge I'm having uh, some stout tonight in honour of Mum. Oh um, yeah, oh yeah. good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm here tuned in with you on that level as well. All oh, right. And everyone else there who's has found it. Uh, They've worked hard today and uh, are now working on the relaxed frequency. Yeah. I came across a Chinese proverb the other day, Dad. Yep. It said, tension is that which you think other people need you to be. Relaxation is who you really are. Oh, interesting. Sounds good. So, uh, anyway, let's, let's have a song for the folks. Uh, this is something that uh, is called Nine Million Bicycles by Katie Malua. We'll be back. No one. 
one can ever say it's true But I know that I will always be with you I'm warm by the fire of your love every day So don't call me a liar Just believe everything that I say There are six billion people in the world More or less And it makes me feel quite small But you're the one I love the most of all Bicycles in Beijing, hey Dad? That's right. Oh. I was, I, there's probably more actually, but I, I, I think that's a really nice song. Yeah, right. I find it, I find it an interesting choice to, to kick it off, seeing as we were talking about CSG. Um, just to acknowledge that, uh, as far as I understand, that the, the companies that are actually pushing for CSG happening in Australia actually come from China, where Beijing is. Is that true? Well, I don't know. Oh, probably. They're into everything, aren't they? Well, I certainly don't claim to be an expert at all. No. Um, but uh, just if there's more bicycles, more people riding bicycles, I suppose, it'll save uh, us pulling the gas out of the ground. But uh, Yeah, oh, well, energy's, energy's the buzzword, isn't it? Yeah. And we've got it, so, you know, we should hang on to it a bit, I reckon. Yeah, right. Hey, um... On uh, yesterday, um, good friend John. Remember John from the Sphinx Rock Cafe? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, he's got his his uh, his big red. The big red is um, Land Cruiser. It's being converted to veggie oil. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. So he wants to sell lots of chips. So he's got lots of fuel. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's certainly going to be a, a nice, healthy conversion <laughs> of energy. I'd say. <laughs> Yeah, interesting, isn't it? There's a, a band playing on Sunday called Stip Ski this Sunday at Sphinx Rock Cafe. All right. Yeah, I've been I've been there a fair bit lately, thankfully. Beautiful place. Yeah, well, it was 12 months as you told me that I was last there. Yes, folks, last last year on this day, um, I went and drove to Ballina and picked up Dad from the airport and brought him to the Mount Burrell area where we um, spent a week together and, and uh, as acknowledged earlier at the show, we climbed Wollumbin in that time frame, which was 20 years after your first climb, hey? Yeah, I staggered up this time. First right. time I went up and leaps and bounds, this time was a bit slow, a bit, a bit embarrassing really. Well, all I can say is I was very proud of you, Dad, for making <laughs> the effort. I know, you, I know it, was, um, it was something that you haven't done for a fair while. No, I hadn't, but... Uh yeah, I just realised how unfit, despite the fact that I ride my bike all the time, it's amazing how unfit you get after a while as you get older. Anyway, mm. keep trying. Yeah. So there's a, that was a nice love theme, that song there. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I've I've certainly looked at uh, the journey of love a lot. I'm very interested in relationships myself, Dad, mm-hmm. and uh, wondered a lot about what dynamic happened with you and Mum, and you know about the, I suppose the projected ideal of of a family and and uh, I suppose the world that we're in we're in now and you know I'll go as deep as you want to go <laughs> about that. Oh well, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do it on air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. I'm certainly definitely been appreciating the model that you've given me and certainly choosing my own way of living and um, yeah yeah well anyway as long as you're you're happy and healthy that's the main thing isn't it that is isn't it that's the best we can give everyone is a health, healthy happy self yeah whatever that, that takes that's the, that's the key to life hmm. whatever that gives even <laughs> yeah I mean happy 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 and healthy, and health is, well, oh, both those two are really important. Yeah. You sent me a uh, a film that I haven't actually seen yet, uh, Food Matters. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know it's essential viewing. Uh, so, and um, maybe everyone else hasn't heard it out there, heard of it or seen it yet, but Food Matters could be a subject next week on the show. Yeah, I, I think you should do a public showing of it, actually. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, that's how I saw it the first time. I had a public showing of it here in Canberra. Why Why would we do that? Well, because I think the more people that get this message, I mean, probably preaching to the converted in your, up in your area, but, um, you know, it's very important, the message that comes through on that particular film. Mm. Which is kind of like what? Oh, well, the, the sickness industry, basically, and the corruption of food and... All that sort of side of things. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're definitely working on solutions here as well. That's why we've got a meeting tomorrow night at uh, the Nimba Neighbourhood Centre about food security. Yep. Uh, food links. So anyone in the in the area can go that, go to that and help pump it up. Um, yeah, food, food security is, is pretty important. Um, but I think quality of food that's that's another um, another important thing um, plus the teaching the ability for people to produce their own food that, mm. that's really important too because uh, I think a lot of people maybe not up in your area but a lot of people are too busy earning money to go and pay for crap food and they are doing that time and growing good quality food themselves which doesn't make sense to me yeah I had a, a chat with someone at the Sphinx Rock Cafe today, visiting with the Tunnable Preschool. That was very lovely to see all the kids rocking up and having fun there. Yep. And we were talking about uh, just how essential it is that the children uh, actually get a ch- get a chance to spend time in the garden and realise that that's where the food's coming from. And yep. maybe it's probably one of the most essential subjects of all. It is, absolutely. I'm, I, I don't know if up in your area you, the schools have what they call the Stephanie Alexander scheme of having... Um, um, a school garden and, and kitchen so that the kids can get involved with growing the food and then cooking it. Um, Stephanie Alexander has been a pioneer of this and has been going that, doing that for a number of years and within a kilometre of where I live here in Canberra, we, one of the primary schools has a, a Stephanie Alexander inspired garden and, and kitchen. So there's got to be more of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Bring it on. I've I've got a song, actually, Dad, that you might not have heard that I think you might appreciate. It's by uh, a lady called Kerry Ann Cox, whose community has been directly affected by the CSG situation. All right. Uh, You interested in hearing it? It's called Bush Tucker. Oh, of course. Yeah, that sounds good. Hey, let's do that. All right. Bush Tucker is good for your health, Munga is sunny. Coming, got um, vitamin C and Barney all is good for eggs. So, in a minute, Bush Tucker, join us now or oh, have a feed. Yummy, yummy, Bush Tucker, eat um, every day. Oh, one gives you stamina. 
Jolga mulder is good for coals, Grajat full of proteins. Ramang narka vegetable, so we don't mean on bush taka. Jonas now oh, have a feed. Yummy, yummy bush taka. Eat on every day, oh bush taka is good for your health. Munga is sunny. Bush taka is good for your health. Munga is sunny. Bush taka is good for your health. Munga is sunny. Bush taka is good for your health. Munga is sunny. So we don't mean on bush taka. Join us now, we'll have a feed. Yummy, yummy, bush taka. Eat them every day. Oh, bush taka is good for your health. Munga is honey. Bush taka is good for your health. Munga is honey. Bush taka is good for your health. Munga is honey. Bush taka is good for your health. Munga. <laughs> yeah, that's Dad listening in the background, having created a bit of feedlet, feedback loop, honey. Yeah. <laughs> so you're tuning into the web, Dad. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's just, it's just better. I can hear that song better on the on the web. I've turned it down now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's. Is she indigenous? Uh, as in from planet Earth. From where? From planet Earth. You know, no, she uh, Aboriginal. She comes from uh, the Western Astra- West, the Broom area, Dad. All oh, right. Okay. So, yeah, because some of the words she was saying um, sounded like they might be Aboriginal. Yes. Well, uh, the colour of her skin is a very good indicator. You can check her out at kerryannecox dot com. Okay. K e double r i a double n e cox c o x dot com. Sorry, K e double r. I look up, Dad. I'll um. Oh, jeez. Realise because you're not on Facebook, you can't actually necessarily tune into the event on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you've got it, Kerry Ann Cox. You can just find her that way. Okay. Uh, a bit later, because you're on Nemo FM 102.3 right now, Dad. Oh, great. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're beaming in some good vibes. And so I just, just like, lushed out with that uh, little tribute to the native foods of this land that... Uh, yeah, uh, a few weeks ago, Dad, uh, you found that Carrie Ann had the opportunity to go to Chogham, but she invited Chogham to come to her people and uh, come and sit in her land and, and learn from from the earth, because we're at a point in time where we really need to get real about what's what's good for us, what really is good for us, yeah. rather than raping the land for example and thinking that that's going to be good for our children or even ourselves so um, some of us have solutions and uh, it's good to see Kerry Ann's really stepping forth with her her community which yep. is expanding realizing that we're all one here um, yeah I've got another song of yours here dad that you selected oh yeah this is apparently a song that brought uh, two people together and uh, their careers flowered after that so let's share some of that flowering I wake up and think of he no matter what I do He's always on my mind In times a day or two Seems to me the things you love the most You always In time, 
Kate Sobrano and Wendy Matthews, you've always got the blues. Uh, some of you who were alive then, back in 1988, um, might have recognised that from an ABC series called Stringer. What was that about, Dad? Do you know? Remember? It was um, um, about a new, newspaper reporter. I, don't, I can't remember in detail, but that's what a Stringer is. A Stringer is a, is a newspaper reporter, as far as I remember. Oh right, and you were just you were just telling me. I don't know if you made the connection, but I did. That uh, you actually, you actually wrote something that went in a newspaper today. Was it the Cape Canberra Times? Was it? Yes, it was. In the Canberra Times today. Yes. You wrote uh, what is it? A letter to the editor or something? Correct. Uh huh. Well done. What was it about? Um, it was about um, about reconciliation um, or recognition of the North or the Vietnamese government um, in regards to the war um, and how um, we, we should um, make peace with them in other, in, in other words but <clears throat> being an ex-Vietnam vet um, and not only me but all the guys I've spoken to are diametrically opposed to that because we actually went to Vietnam to stop the spread of communism and, and to uphold democracy which we have here now but the problem is, in Vietnam, they don't have democracy. They have communism still, and they don't. The people don't have freedom, um, and so they're still oppressed. Um, human rights are still, um, still still a problem. And for us to now say, "Oh yeah, we make peace with you," um, 
it's, would just be saying, well, that's all right, we accept that what you're doing is correct, and we don't, and we fought for that. 550 Australian servicemen lost their lives trying to uphold democracy. Right. And I think it would be you know, a slur against them if we now recognise them. It would be a different story if they held free elections right now and as a, as a, re, a regime tr change, um, but that's not going to happen, so why should we recognise that? Hmm. Yes. That's the bottom line. Yeah, the concept of democracy and communism when we're all on this planet together. Oh, uh, yeah. It's well, it's, it's a matter of, you know, I mean, you either believe in freedom of speech, like what we're exercising right this minute, um, or, or you just have to be constrained and, and you only say what the government allows you to say. Um, and we just take that, that freedom for granted. Well, I, I certainly don't take it for granted. I'm very, very honoured to be here in Onim FM and that we uh, have very authentic local community radio happening right here. And this is the expression of it, empowered local global communication. So that's, that's fantastic news. But like, uh, you know, this you know, democracy versus communism thing, like, I, I just want to bring it a bit closer to home because I know what you've been going through personally. I don't know if you've made the connection also... But uh, you you were pretty affected by your experience in Vietnam, and and just uh, you clarified for me off air there that uh, actually you went to Vietnam as soon as you got to Australia, so you didn't set up the cleaning business until after. But that uh, I know you haven't even really been able to talk to me much about anything that really happened for you in Vietnam, um, but it did affect you, and you've been trying to get some sort of um, compensation situation happening for that, and. I know that a lot of the Vietnam vets uh, were not only hammered by being in the envir environment of Vietnam, but also socially were, in, were hammered by the people of Australia because of the, the discord between, uh, I suppose, media and expression of what was really going on at the time. Uh, how, how was that for you? Like, I mean, if we bring it back to the Australian government, whether we recognise... Uh, anyone else like your own treatment at this point in time you've been sent from review to review to review just it seems like a draining ongoing process for your own personal situation as a as a vet um well i i can only put i can only see it from my perspective and how a lot of other people have been treated but um yeah we we did suffer over there um psychologically and it a lot of it doesn't manifest itself till some time later and that's what happened in my case it, you know this post traumatic stress disorder starts to creep in um gradually more and more as you get older it happens and luckily i have had treatment for it and i'm hopefully reasonably sane now but it does prevent me from working um and and has done for the last nine nine years basically mm. um and yeah it's just a constant battle with the department of veterans affairs to to get them to accept that um you know the, well, my particular case i have a case and um yeah and the problem is that, that all these experts get thrown into hats get thrown into the ring and every come everyone jumps to the wrong conclusion about stuff and you know, it's just them really, really trying to make it hard for you because it means they've got to pay out some money. And um, I, when I look at where money is wasted and people, I don't want to be political about asylum seekers or anything, but I just, you know, I don't begrudge them getting money, but I do begrudge the fact that people that have served this country are treated so badly um, compared with someone that jumps on a leaky boat and comes here and, and immediately gets all sorts of um, rights and payments and, you know, all sorts of stuff, free legal advice and, um, yeah. So it's just, it's just a bit galling, some of all that stuff. So you, you, you're in an interesting boat yourself. You came over as a 10-pound palm and then found yourself fighting for another country <laughs> in another country. That's um, pretty classic. 
Oh, no, look, I I have no... I mean, I volunteered to go and do that. It's not like I was conscripted to go and do it. I wanted to do it. Why? Well, because, as you know, I have a a service where our family has an army background, and it seemed the right thing to do. But the problem is that, um, you know, we went through it, and then I was going to make a career out of being in the army, and then I decided, well, this is such a waste of time. And the way that Australian people treated us servicemen was absolutely despicable. I said, well, I just don't want to be a part of this anymore. Mm. Um, and so I, I got out of the army. Um, yeah, right. Mm. So uh, was it the people generally um, being very against war in, in, in general and that just was reflected on, on the troops then? Yeah, well, no, it was... Well, I don't really know if it was war in general. It was it was the Vietnam War. Um, um, I think there was a big problem that people didn't understand that about communism as much as perhaps I did, having come from from Europe and living on the on the border. Of, when I lived in Germany. We were right on the border and facing the Cold War, and um, and. Uh, so we're much closer to communism than than here. Anyway, I was happy to go to Vietnam, but I wasn't happy with how I was treated. You know, just an example, while we were over there, the posties decided to use their political muscle and and prevent mail coming to us. I mean, that is just absolutely disgusting that, mm. you know, the Union should, should have entered that war and so personally affecting... Um, the guys who were trying to do the right thing. And, you know, mail was pretty important to us to get stuff coming back from our, our loved ones. Mm. But isn't, isn't that the perfect uh, mechanism of war, is, is uh, separation of, from communication? Well, yeah. but not, not when it's your own people doing it to you. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, well... Hang on, I must have missed something there. I thought you were talking about the... The posties, as in Australian posties. Yes, yeah, Australian oh, mate, sorry, posties. I made an assumption you were talking about the Vietnamese posties. No, no. Oh, really? That's really, really shocking. The Australian post postal um, workers stop mail coming to to Australian troops in Vietnam. Mm. And at one stage, the wharfies stopped loading um, stuff too onto the ships that were coming to Vietnam to resupply us with important stuff like beer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's just sort of that was that's pretty galling when you're when you're over there and under harsh conditions, and then you find that your own people are against you as well. And and you know, but when we came back, we were we were treated pretty badly. You know, it was the days of long hair, and we didn't have long hair. And when we got off the plane, we were spat at and had paint thrown at us. I mean, not saying everyone, but. We were very easily identified because of the way we dressed and mm. had our hair. Yeah. Now, now it's the opposite. You know, people shave their head. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you come to Nimbin, you'll find you'll find plenty, plenty of those folks. What the shaved ones or the long-haired ones? Uh, look, anything actually. Bit of both. Yeah, I think so. Look, you'll find anything here. I know. Uh, well, I know Nimbin. What did you find? What did you feel about Nimbin when you came here last year? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I hadn't. I hadn't spent enough time there to really make a full judgment. It's very hard, isn't it? Whether you're only there for a day. Hey, I got to say, like that day that we did come into Nimbin, you can you can testify yourself. You heard drums. Um, we heard drums, didn't we, when we got into town? Yeah, I think there was some drumming going on. Yeah, yep. and you you pretty much headed straight to the pub, and I went and jumped on a drum for a little while. Well, I don't know where you'd gone. <laughs> That's what I was doing. It was the first time I've ever turned up in Nimbin and heard drums going like, I have been here pretty, a lot. Yeah, no, so I remember that, the drums of that when been. I went up there and, and we went to the markets in Burren Bay. There must have been 20, 20 or so in a circle drumming. Do you remember that day? Hmm. That was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, well, Nimbin's been lifting it up every week, the... Nimbin Street drummers are rocking out Friday, oh, night, Friday nights. Excellent. So I suspect that was possibly the Friday. We, we finally got to Nimbin on the Friday. Yeah. Yeah. 
so um, now I've, you've given me some some other songs here also, and I've got one called Hine a Hine. Oh yes, this is a, this is um, I, I spent some time in New Zealand, so I, I was a bit <laughs> inspired by um, some new uh, Kiwi type music, and this is um, Dame Kiri Takanawa with some males, obviously. And um, I, I lived in the Bay of Islands. Th this song isn't actually Kiri Takanawa. Isn't she singing it? Oh, uh, no, not this particular version. Oh, anyway, uh, that, uh, the LP that comes from is called Kiri um, Maori Song, so that's probably one that she's not, maybe not singing, but the whole album was named after her. Right. And, um, yeah, and I, I used to sail around the Bay of Islands, and which is actually where she lives. Oh, okay. Um, Context. Yeah, she's got a nice house overlooking the water there. Um, but she's a fantastic singer. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've actually got another song to come before that because I think it's contextually your way to uh, New Zealand, where it's on a boat. And uh, this song, this song is... I, I, I definitely appreciated the first time uh, visiting your yacht at yep. the Gold Coast. Yeah. And uh, my memories with this song special. Right. Um, yeah, so here it is. You with me? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is it. Rod Stewart. Yep. Sailing. So you were headed across the ocean, so here it is. I am sailing. I am sailing. the sea I am sailing stormy waters to be near you to be free I am flying I am flying like a bird the sky I am flying passing high
So we've been sailing with Rod Stewart and uh, in the background there, like I almost feel like we should have been um, talking over that song, but yeah, I wanted you to enjoy the beautiful Rod Stewart there, just, but uh, Dad said that there's actually, uh, it's not really about sailing, but that's certainly why I was leading to it, because Dad's a, an avid sailor, but he said it was about relationships. Hello? Hello, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that, that's what I've been. I mean, when I when I first heard that song, I always just related it to sailing, and but it, in fact, it, it's got a deeper meaning, or, or it's got a different meaning. It's it's to do with relationships. I understand. Mm. But I'm not that deep and meaningful, so I, <laughs> sailing's fine with me. Yeah, right. I, I remember remember this time when I came and visited your yacht at Southport back in the uh, middle holidays my year 12 and uh, you, you had a moment uh, there with uh, a lady um, with Rod Stewart playing over and over and over on, and we were on the boat so I certainly was brought into relationships uh, yeah. and I do, I do feel like raising it because of the subject of relationships because um, yeah I, I ended up uh, operating as your solicitor um, three months out of year 12 because of a, a case that you had in front of the law, the family law court. Oh, you don't talk to me about that. Bloody <laughs> <laughs> oh, disaster that one, wasn't it? Well, uh, yeah, I certainly certainly gave me an impression that the, the family law court wasn't necessarily a, a just organisation, which was really shattering, really. Yeah. Leaving year 12, being a couple of months off 18, not, not able to not vote for John Howard because I was 17 and 10 months. But yeah, the whole, that whole thing, uh, getting to witness the, the actual legal process in, in action and, and not feel like it was just was really disappointing. Yeah. Uh, and oh. yeah, we don't need to harp on it, but certainly I've got to say that it inspired me to find solutions to the situation. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it, it's, it's all to do with, it's not about the individual parties it's to do with money and it's to do with money and 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 lawyers i mean that that's the bottom line it's it's you get um you get enough money on the table um you know the lawyers can smell it and they'll they'll protract things as long as they can to get what they can out of it hmm. but um the good thing about all that was that i ended up in new zealand because of it Yes, <laughs> that was that was quite amazing. Yeah, that was that was fantastic because after all that family law situation that they and I got to say I witnessed some lies go over pretty heavy that uh, bankrupted my father here, and uh, so Dad had to sort of take the law into his own hands, and uh, he did that by packing his boat and going to another island <laughs> far away yeah. from Australia. I was proud of you, Dad. But, uh, but the law is still caught up with me. Yeah. Because they wanted their money. Oh, anyway, right. that's another story. Yeah. But anyway, New Zealand was a fantastic place to be for four years, and I have some very fond memories of New Zealand. Very healing memories, actually. Very healing place, New Zealand. Right. Particularly where I was. I met some wonderful people. Very giving people, and... I don't mean financially, I mean, I mean spiritually giving people. Mm. Excellent, yeah, lovely yeah. people. No, mm. I agree. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we were on the subject of law, but I think we're going to break for a song here. Um, this is the one that we were promising just before. Hine a Hine, this one is actually, this song is by Hayley Westenra. Do you know that? Yeah, it's not by Terry Kitsakanawa. Yeah. Well, tell me if you recognise this. Hine e hine.
it's like it doesn't exactly work out exactly what you, you think was ideal for example I'm talking about like a dream at night or whatever but I suppose it could be a daydream yeah. um, they're all possibly warnings of opportunity to create it better yeah. than what you're seeing or what you've seen so hence the sharing of wisdom um, yeah I, I did did notice that uh, I was proud of you also for having the cheapest petrol in Canberra and certainly as a little boy I, I didn't I didn't sort of think about the looming energy crisis the planet's facing and that maybe we should um, be creating something else at the time uh, especially when you created a, a recycled oil product called Pearson's Recycled Oil and getting to see your face in the paper and see your product go national, that was exciting. And uh, But th that's about as far as it went, right? Well, unfortunately, yeah, because I, I was too successful and major oil companies don't like that, especially when you beat them at their own game. And uh, so they tend to want to close you up and that's what happened. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, that's pretty full on. I I wondered what was going on. Yeah. Seems like things took a turn for you then, Dad. Yeah, it did actually. Um, the turning point was when I won the contract for Brisbane City Council to supply them with recycled oil because I, it was during the time when recycling was starting to happen and you know, collect paper, collect oil, collect cans, whatever you've got to collect. You know, do the recycling, and, and um, so I went to Brisbane City Council. And I said, "Look, you, you're not you, you're not recycling until you use the end product." Mm. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, well, we better start using recycled oil then. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well. and that that's when um, that's when things became a problem because I was the only one that could really supply them, even though I was being supplied by a subsidiary of Shell. So. At the highest price tendered, I won the contract. Which that was that was just too much for all these guys. Anyway, I achieved that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the result was uh, a showing of uh, what happens when a monopoly and uh, dictatorship is happening on a corporate level. Oh, yeah, but there are other instances of, of that. I mean, uh, it's like, you know, you're talking about energy crisis and all that sort of thing. And I don't know if you remember... At my petrol station, we had those underground tanks with the vent pipes. Yep. And I put those valves on. Yeah, yeah, to save uh, from uh, evaporating fuel. Yeah. Well, that that was a that was another story. Really. Oh, That's... absolutely. I mean, at that particular time, we were losing about three to four percent of our fuel and. In evaporation up to these tank uh, up through the vent pipes right and if everyone observes every every service station has vent pipes from the yeah. underground tanks yeah and what's happening is fuel is constantly evaporating from those um, yeah, straight into the environment yeah and they wreck well I don't know uh, yeah I'm into the environment I don't know how bad that is for the environment but I wouldn't think it'd be doing it any good hmm. um, but the point was at the time, Australia was losing something like 200 million litres of fuel through evaporation every year. Mm. So the last thing the oil companies wanted to do was to was to stop that 200 million litres going into, into the air because that was all profit for them. Because they, the oil companies sold the fuel to the service station and if it evaporated for them, well, that's just too bad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, passive so income. The, <laughs> I did a wonderful time of fighting the, the dangerous goods inspector in Canberra um, who marched up to my site one day and said, those are dangerous. Um, we, we decided those are dangerous um, and we want you to remove them straight away. And I said, I'll refuse to, sorry. Um, and if you come <laughs> again, I'll call the television cameras. You want me to... <laughs> Move them or not, I never saw them again. Yeah, right. It's funny, but when I leased the service station out, um, they were gone within a week. And the new, the new guy, he just, he just relented. So, do people use these things now? These days, where are we at? Uh, Twenty 
years or oh, so. Oh, no, they're not, they're not used in Australia at all, except um, I think some of the depots have them, which are actually owned by the service, mm. by the oil companies. Yeah. But I believe overseas they're used a lot. But yeah. of course they wouldn't be in Australia, would they? Well, it seems like we, we're living in the lap of the gods a little bit, a little bit of amnesia of um, what's going on for other people. And, uh, yeah. No, but we are actually experiencing it now because, uh, for example, a lot of people from overseas want gas from Australia, so they're coming to get it. And we don't actually like that idea. So we have to work it out. Communism, democracy, I don't know what the answer is about all that, but we we, we all got to work it out together. Well, um, I would have thought that was, you know, the gas that was already being produced, you know, from North Shore, Northwest Shelf, places like that, would supply enough people without having to go into this coal seam gas business. Hmm. Uh, with its potential, I'm not saying there is, but potential environmental damage that it could do, particularly to the water table. Why, why aren't you saying that? Why, why are you saying oh, potential? Why, isn't there a fair bit of evidence? Proving? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm saying that because I don't know enough about that to be able to make a, a, a comment exactly. I'm you know, taking the study to do that, and um, the government don't know enough about it either, which is why they're going to hold this independent inquiries into it, studies into it. Mm. But, I mean, that's what governments do all the time. They never make a decision. They actually call a, a committee or an inquiry or something to delay actually having to make a decision about anything. Mm. Goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, I mean we can delay forever and ever and, and and not get anywhere with something. Yeah, we might as well just go get the gas out already. Okay, yeah. let's go get it. Yeah, they uh, get they get the gas and, <laughs> and worry about it later. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. It's not good business, really, uh, when you add up all the the hidden factors, the hidden costs of uh, being in such a a rush. Isn't that right, gentlemen? We've got to treat our lady planet earth with uh, a little bit of tenderness and care so we can get the share the share the spoils the bliss of this place mm. um yeah full on so i mentioned the convoy that's happening uh they're heading out tomorrow from here um uh, working working on a simple awareness the the precautionary principle suggesting to all of these people in a hurry that they they ought to uh, slow down um, before we cause too much damage. So a bit of precautions before, yeah. So the con convoy could be a, a nice condom on the CSG situation. <laughs> a bit of, anyway. Um, yeah, so how's, how's it all going there? Dad, you enjoying the show? We've been on the air with Nimbin for nearly over an hour now yeah they must be sick of me by now well ah uh, mate i hope they love you i love you <laughs> okay i've got a i've got a song here that uh is nice and chilled out it could be even meditative uh something like this so we'll uh, we'll be back shortly uh but you tune in, all you folks. Feel your heart. <laughs> like, don't let me tell you what to do.
That was Deva Pramal, Gayatri Mantra Meditation. Hope you've all enjoyed tuning back with that. Yeah. So we're just talking a little bit. Uh, Dad got inspired and did for Passionate. Tell us about that, Dad. Um. Yeah. I guess everyone knows what the Passionate is, but it's a it's a form of meditation that was the original one started by by Buddha apparently. Um. And this was lost in time, but someone in Burma. Um, it was the, the, the tradition kept going and it was sort of kept going in Burma and then it was resurrected about 20 years ago, I think, mm-hmm. um, by a guy called um, Gorenka. Gorenka. Gorenka, yeah, who was... Um, um, Satrum. Indian guy who who actually learnt it in um, in Burma and then took it to back to India, and now the passion centres are right around the world, mm. um, including one Dharma Pasadi, which is at Rosebank in this area. Yeah, the in this area. Center. And I think they're going to try and build a a reasonable size meditation centre there. With, People can go and stay there. And, yeah, and the, the way it starts is that you have to do a 10-day meditation. That's the beginning of it. You silent meditation, right? It's absolutely silent, yeah. Um, you can't even look at people. So when, you, when you're walking around, you keep your eyes to, to um to the ground or you don't make eye contact with anyone. So there's no psychic projections or uh, yeah, wondering ag- about other people just yeah, focus it's, on it's yourself. Yeah, it's egocentric, that's the idea. You're meant to be com- totally within yourself for those 10 days. Um, and the meditation start um, at 4.30 in the morning, having got up at 4, and then you do two hours either in your room or at the meditation centre till 6.30 in the morning. And this goes right through until 9.30 at night um, with breaks. Um, and the food is um, very basic, but very nutritious. It's you know, lovely food. I was never hungry the whole time I did it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so 10 days, it's quite, you have to be quite disciplined to do it. What, what were you doing that for? Oh, I just felt I wanted to do something different, and um, someone suggested that it might be might be something good that I could do. Mm. And um, I I've done I've done yoga a lot, as you know, and um, but, but yoga is a form of meditation in a way. Um, like ele- there's elements in of, of meditation in yoga. Mm. But this is very, very disciplined um, in that you have to sit absolutely still and concentrate on your breathing for an hour. And this that's quite difficult because um, you've got to get into a really comfortable position and then you can't move from that position. Um, and so, you, you know, sometimes you're in quite a lot of pain, but you've just got to work your way through it. Breathe into it. Yeah, breathe. Well, it's breathing. Yeah, I'm breathing into it, I suppose. But and out of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's all about seeing things as they really are, and the concept of um, oh, what's the word? Presence, equanimity, equanimous. Yeah. yeah, equanimity. That's the word. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Mm, this thing beat. about seeing things as they really are and, and how think, how nothing is permanent. Um, yeah, so it's quite an interesting discipline to be able to work through and and this, this, this business of breathing through all the parts of your body is quite interesting. So mm. you're actually listening to your body and what's, what's reacting in it and this varies every day. So the first three days, an example, you're sitting there, and and all you, 
All you're taught to do is to breathe through your nose and feel the sensation of the of your breath in your nose. Now, it's quite hard to do, actually, <laughs> for hour after hour after hour. But that just gives you, tunes your body into being able to listen to yourself. And then it progresses through the rest of the body over time. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's the Vipassana. Vipassana. And they want to produce, have one of these centers in, at Rosebank. Bring it on. Well, yeah, but apparently, I mean, I don't know too much about it, but this has been going through Lismore City Council. Um, I think there are some objectors to it. But they're very peaceful places. I mean, it's not like they have raging parties or anything. It's a, it's a very peaceful flat thing, and um, when people go there, they're only going, they're going for 10 days at a time, so it's not, I and mean, you're not allowed to leave the premises. Yeah, right. Um, so it's not going to be much in the way of traffic movements or huh. things like that. Yeah, well, I suppose like if people start meditating and uh, might have to call the police, eh? Hey? Well, that's right. I mean, call my can't, brother. <laughs> you, can't, you can't. You can't have people, you know, sitting around meditating all day. Hey. <laughs> hey. Um. Disturbing the peace or being peaceful, disturbing everyone else. Mm. I wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, this week, in four days' time, it's going to be uh, Michael, my only brother, your son, other son, his galactic birthday. Um, well, I'll let him know. He'll be delighted to hear that. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 um, he's a police officer, he um, which Nimbin already knows, um, in Queensland. He works for the Queen, apparently. I always wonder if it's, if, if it's our grandmother or, or which Queen he means. But, uh, yeah, he works for the Queen. And, yeah, uh, yesterday was Nathan Kay's galactic birthday, and I'd, I've given him the opportunity to come in or um, call. I think he's touring or something. Um, we, we were talking a few weeks ago about, about a post I made in a, a, a group about Occupy, Occupy Byron Bay, and uh, I'm sure the Occupy is occupying everywhere by now, um, which is fantastic news. Um, but how do you feel about... Um, you know, my brother, your son, being a um, policeman. Well, it's sort of, that's what he's chosen to do. Yep. Um, he's, uh, he has a very difficult job um, because society places all sorts of pressures on police. I mean, uh, no one likes police until they're in trouble themselves and then they love them. Huh. This is the worry, isn't it? You know, like... Um, if there's no problems, mm. then they don't like the police. But as soon as there's someone holding a gun at your head, they like the police. Yeah, when <laughs> Come the, and help them, you know. When the social order breaks down, the police yeah, are there to mop order. up. Right. Um, that's, who, that's who we end up calling because that's what we're paying them to do, um, which, is, which is fair enough. But you're referring to the actual social situation um, where people aren't actually necessarily pulling their weight um, on the social level and, and dealing with their own shit yeah. and they're calling the cops to sort it out when they really could sort it out themselves. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem with, too, with police is that, you know, society produces laws and they're in the position of having to enforce them. And now, some people don't like that, but it's not the police's fault. Hmm. It's, um, it's society, if people don't like the laws, well, they change them. They don't, they don't bash up the police because of the laws. Um, and quite often, I think, police don't exactly enjoy doing what they have to do, but they have to because that's what their role is. So would you, would you say, like, in a, in a modern sense in this contemporary moment that... Uh my brother, your son, Michael, is actually um, experiencing something being in that role as a police officer, just like you as a, a Vietnam vet also were experiencing. You get, you're get on both sides getting hammered by within within your organisation and by the people in general. For well, he's being hammered at the moment. I mean, just as an example, um, the budget cuts. Um, he's just lost. Two hundred dollars a fortnight out of his pay, um, yeah, right. because of budget cuts. Now he's 
expected to still do the same job. So, it, you know, that, it's not real good for morale, that sort of thing. And, you know, and that he's in the Queensland Police, and of course what was happening in the New South Wales Police, which is all the problem that's going on at the moment with their compensation and disability stuff being eroded. I mean, these guys, they, they put themselves in the, in the face of danger. Some of them get injured quite badly. And now they're going to be not compensated in the way they used to because of budget cuts. So it's pretty hard for these guys to know that they're not going to be supported if they get injured when they go to a a disturbance or whatever. Um, yeah, so... I saw Michael went to that, he went to a, a disturbance recently and he was uh, he was injured and he's still injured and apparently it could be that he's going to be permanently injured. Who is? My, your brother. Oh, is he? Yeah. Since when? Well, what, just this week or something? No, no, it's been going on for months. Oh. But you were just saying the other day that he's fit as he's. He's what? You were saying that he's really strong and. Well, he is, but he's not as strong as he could be. He can't do all the things he used to be able to do. He's is very strong, hmm. but he's permanently. It looks like the injury is going to be permanent. Far out. Yeah. Well, that's crazy news. Yeah. Well, I mean that. That is. Um, so for the rest of his life, he's going to carry an injury. Because he went to a disturbance where this this guy was out on drugs, beating up his mother, and he had to go and separate them. Oh right, that yeah. Yeah, it that. goes back months. Yeah, yeah, it's too long. Yeah, so this guy oh. high on high on drugs. Um, yeah, so he intervenes, and <laughs> so he went to save someone else's mother from their from from her son. Yeah. And got injured. That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, right. Well, I suppose, like, um, mum's not with us in, in physical form anymore, so he's got to be out there saving other people's mothers from <laughs> yeah, um, well. children that just uh, haven't got any respect for their mother. Yeah. Something in that for all of us, maybe. Yeah. Oh, that's that's um, a shame to hear that. So what's the, the solution here as far as people... People uh, having maybe more compassion, maybe not jumping so quick to judge a situation, and um, in order to, yeah, create more understanding among all of us. Well, I mean, one of the things is that you know he he might next time he goes to one of those disturbances say, well, look, this guy's dangerous, and so either you know let mum get beaten up, or what happens, or do I just stand back mm. because I might get injured and then not get looked after? Yeah. And that's going to happen right throughout the whole police force. Yeah. You know, what, what's more important, my, the rest of my life, or stepping in and, and helping someone? Mm. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, I suppose it's, we're, in, we're in an age of ethics now. We're working out what the real priorities are and the best conduct. And... Uh, we're in the now. We've got the power to change it uh, toward the better. And every day we're presented with opportunities to make those changes. Uh, so next time we see cops, let's bring them some love. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. yeah, it's just a very hard job for these guys, I think, a lot of the time. Mm. Yeah, very hard. So uh, let, we've been getting a bit sombre now. Um, yeah, look, lots up. of love to Michael. Uh, whose galactic birthday is in four days, white cosmic mirror. But let's have some, let's have some fruit. This is some live action. Um, these guys are playing at the Halstead Market. So uh, Dad chose some fruit. Uh, it's a band that's no longer with us in that form. Um, a number of years ago, this song is called Wind Blows. Because I'd really like to feel you next to my skin
All right, Dad, you were just telling me. You were just, I was asking you what, what made you choose uh, fruit. What was uh, going on with that? Yeah, well, fruit, like, when I was in New Zealand, one of the jobs I had um, was to manage this um, cinema and cafe. Yeah, right. And in a place called Kerry Kerry. Yeah, yeah. And this cinema was built in the 1930s. And it was uh-huh. one of these buildings where you had a sort of raised area, like a, a tiered area at the back, and then and then a flat area which could convert into a dance floor, and then there was a stage at the front with the screen. So what happened was all the chairs got, which all like bench-type chairs, were pushed under the stage, uh-huh. and then you had this big dance floor. And then, anyway, this particular group came and appeared at the Bay Islands Festival, and our cinema was was one of the venues for the Bay of Islands Festival, which is in the North Island of New Zealand. And that's when they were a group that appeared. And um, I, I, they were very, very popular and they're very talented people. And um, anyway, a couple of years later, when I came back to Canberra, um, I actually went and saw them with my sister here in Canberra. So I had a bit of a following for them. Mm. Yeah, right, so you're running a, a, a cinema and cafe. That's not dissimilar to the Bush Theatre. Uh, I can't help noticing uh, the synchronicity. Um, Andrea Soler, the daughter of Danielle, who is a uh, proprietor with, Dan- uh, with Belinda there at the Bush Theatre. He's the, he is her father. And she's got a gig there at the Bush Theatre next week. Have you been there, Dad? No, we're about to in Nimbin, is it? Yeah. No, I haven't been there. All right. Well, I went to the Ukai, Fair, Ukai Hall with you, remember that? Right, yeah, it's, what, what do you remember about that? <laughs> about that? Oh, I remember crystals and candles and all sorts of talk. And Remember that night? I do, actually, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That, <laughs> that was the International Day of Peace. Oh, that's right. The yeah. 21st of September 2008. Yeah, oh, right. activate synchronicity, if anyone was there. Yeah. I'm sure there was. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good night. Yeah, yeah. So, well, um, thanks for mentioning that because I like to acknowledge activate synchronicity because as as we become more conscious of it, we become more conscious of it. Yeah. Funny. Yeah, and uh, I I did did see some footage. You were talking to a friend at that occasion. You ha- had no idea what I was on about at all. Was that true? I. No, I still don't know. What? Tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I've stopped uh, trying to explain it. I think <laughs> save you all <laughs> from that. Um, yeah, well, in the in the live time, it's been fantastic to to have you rocking out with us and Nimbin and sharing some magical moments. And look, there's probably hours and hours we could be doing such as that. And who knows? There might be a future opportunity come up. Um, yeah, we've s- looked at some cool subjects. Yeah. So I've, I've appreciated uh, the diversity of topics we've got to. Um, and yeah, I know that we haven't even touched the, touched the tip of the iceberg yet. Uh. Um, who we really are <laughs> on this planet Earth. Uh, so anything else you want to sh- say to to Nimbin Nimbin Town Dad? Oh and planet well. Earth. Yeah, Nimbin. Nimbin Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a peaceful place. I like it. And that whole area is just beautiful. Some sort of magic is in that area, which yeah. is probably why you're there. There's a very good reason why I'm here. Yeah. There's endless reasons, in fact, yeah. why I'm here with you people, we people. Um, yeah. So it's the paramagnetism of the place. Paramagnetism. Yep. Ooh. Volcanic rocks exude paramagnetism. That's why the place is so fertile. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that's why we're saying, frack off. Well, that's, that's a good thing to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I even put paramagnetic rocks in my garden. Right. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a byproduct of, of um, it's the crushing industry, you know, for making road base. Mm-hmm. All the dust from that and the quarries from basalt. And basalt is a paramagnetic rock to put in the garden, and um, it 
adds all these minerals to the to the soil. Mm. Also lightens up the soil and makes plants grow better, which is why your area up there is so paramagnetic. It's volcanic. Yeah, right. Mm. Paramagnetic. Paramagnetic. Paramagnetism. Yeah. Like good. So that that'd explain why um, there's so many paranoid stone is around. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Stone. Like paranoid I, and stoned, yeah. <laughs> Look, I was just looking for a joke, you know. There's a yeah, joke no, everywhere. Well. Yeah, cheers, mate. Oh, well, we'll see the light. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, like, for the projected potential of sharing my father with Nimbin, I'm really glad to uh, have been able to be here with you and I uh, want to send my love to Granny and Grandpa as well. Yep. If you can... I don't know, give him a hug from me. <laughs> yeah, I'll do. Yeah, that's fantastic. And do hope to catch up with them sooner than later. Yeah. Um, maybe, I don't know if the big joint's still down in Canberra, is it? I don't know. The what? The big joint. Did you see it? No. No. What's the big joint? Oh, the big joint. Um, uh, it was a, a splendid offering for Barack Obama, I understand. Um, coming from all the way from Nimbin. There's a, a very large joint, very large, uh, just in time for the joint, the joint, uh, joint hearing sitting or something between poli- oh, politicians. Oh no, I, I that didn't get any publicity here. I didn't see it. Yeah, damn. Yeah. Well, thankfully. Barrack didn't say anything to me about it. <laughs> oh, Barrack didn't talk to you. <laughs> no, no, about no. It. not this time. No. All right. Yeah. Um, um, and did Frederick and Mary, who were here yesterday. All right. Um, yeah. Who were they? Um, Princess Mary and Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark. Oh, okay. They they were in Canberra yesterday. All right, cool. Yeah, and, and about three weeks ago the Queen was here. Oh, we, we got a few visitors. Yeah, sweet. Passing through, costing everyone heaps of money. Hmm. Anyway, the place gets cleaned up a bit. Well, whose money is it anyway, hey? If it's got the Queen on it, yeah. who owns it? Is it is it for the people, or what? I don't know. It's got Queen's head on it, but it hasn't got Barack Obama's. So maybe we should put his head on it. Hmm. Well, he's a red Skywalker, just like the Queen. Maybe. Are they both red Skywalkers? Yeah, they're both red Skywalkers, yep. Oh. Yeah, I found it funny that Australia Day this year felt fell on a red resonant Skywalker Day, the Queen's galactic birthday this year. Oh. So I just found that nice prophetic joke. Yeah, well, that's um, interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Because we're talking about sovereignty and, uh, you know, the galactic code that I refer to uh, does refer to the sovereignty of being born on planet Earth. That's the truth. And we all share this, the bounty of this life. That's the truth. Mm. So thanks, Dad, for your participation in, in my existence. Yeah, okay. Well, I hope, you, I hope, I hope the ra- ratings go through the roof after this. <laughs> Who's rating what here? <laughs> I don't know. I just yeah, no, you haven't told me anyone's rung up and told me to get off yet. Well, um, I Maybe don't know. Maybe they're about to. Look, I, don't, I wouldn't know yeah, if they yeah. would because we've only got one line into the studio here. Yeah. Um, but and people only, can, um, can... And probably only four listeners. Yeah. Four... We're two of them. <laughs> well, I hope we're listening. <laughs> yeah. And I told someone else to listen online, but they didn't get... They didn't... So how, how how can you be talking to your son? Oh, oh, they just couldn't get... We haven't got a radio, she said. Oh, God. Yeah, how well. do you explain modern technology to... Oh, look, everyone around Nimbin's got the same situation. We've got a very small transmitter here, but we've got a very big web link. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> the world. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, All right, I better go. Oh, will you? All right. Um, I love you and leave you. Yeah, look, it would just... I thought we just started, but yeah, okay. We're just tapping. Yeah. Oh. I've got a cool song here, though, as an outro then for you, Dad. Oh, what is it? Um, oh, it's by Andrea Soler. Oh, yeah. She's a sweetie oh. from this area. She's um, the, the daughter of Danielle Soler uh, from the Bush Theatre. Yeah. Um, right. Now, I think this, that this is probably the song we'll go for. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll say goodbye then. All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, no, just we love you. Okay.